Before the modern urban sprawl, the land south of Los Angeles was great for farming. As the warm, wet air comes in off the Pacific Ocean, it climbs the series of mountain ranges several miles inland. It cools, and the water it carries condenses and falls back onto those mountains and the flatland below as rain. This water washes into rivers and creeks and carries mineral nutrients like calcium and phosphorus down the hills. The land here is rocky, but the soil is rich. Vegetables grow very well in the area. So does produce like oranges, lemons, avocado, grapes, and berries. But just across the mountains, the land is nothing but desert. All the water fell back on the mountains. The air here is dry, so is the land. Very little grows, as Walter Knott learned while trying to homestead a 160-acre plot of land here during the 1910s. But his family managed to stick it out and earned the claim to their land. After a few years working on another farm, Walter Knott moved his family to Buena Park in December 1920 to start a berry farm with his cousin. That first year was tough, especially when much of their young crop died out because of a series of rare hard freezes. But compared to the homestead life out in the Mojave, this was nothing. As Walter himself later put it, quote, those desert years were some of the best years of our life. They taught us much we would need to know in the future. The hardships we endured made us tough. After what we went through there, nothing could face us. That would prove especially true over the next decade. Those first few years in Buena Park weren't great. As if the freeze wasn't bad enough, by the time the Preston and Knott farm started actually producing, prices had crashed. The end of World War I dealt a double blow to the farming sector. First, thousands of veterans, including one young animator from Missouri, were returning home looking for work. At the same time, Farms across Europe, which had sat dormant as war ravaged those countries, now returned to production. This increase in supply of both product and labor sent prices down, and many farms with them. The agricultural depression of the next few years meant that the Knots were never quite comfortable economically, even if the farm was producing well. One bit of good news for the Knots came on April 22, 1922 their youngest daughter and final child, Marion, was born there on the farm. Little could anyone know then how important she would be to the future of this piece of land. It's unclear how much Walter's cousin Jim Preston actually helped in farming the land, since he had his own farms to run, but not definitely was the one in charge on this farm. Using the lessons he learned in the last decade of farming, first as a boy in Pomona, then working various farms as a teenager, then in Shandon over the last three years, Walter embarked on a particularly ambitious goal, to have the largest, best berry farm in the whole state of California. As the shaky start of the first few seasons gave way to better growing results over the next few years, Preston and Knott's farm expanded to over 35 acres, with rhubarb, asparagus, and other plants in addition to their variety of berries. During the 1923 season, Walter decided to start selling their berries directly to the public through a little farm stand. This wasn't some new, novel idea, nor was it anything special. It was just a little shack leaning against a tree with an empty old cigar box to act as a cash register. But the berries sold, and sold well. By the following berry season, in spring 1924, Walter set up a more permanent wooden stand out along Grand Avenue, the main highway leading to Buena Park up north. This original berry stand stood for almost 90 years in the theme park, but at the time, it was a place for Cordelia, Walter's wife, and their growing children to help bring in money 
while Walter tended to farm business. 1924 was the same year that Preston and Knott launched their first catalog, focused mainly on selling berry plants from their new nursery. In 1927, the extended lease Preston and Knott had on their original 20 acres of land came to an end. Jim Preston decided to move about six and a half miles northwest to start his own berry farm near the town of Norwalk. But Walter stayed behind. In fact, he offered to buy 10 acres of the land from his new landlord, William Coffrin's son, Sam, at $1,500 an acre. It seems that Walter himself told a few different versions of the land deal's story over the years, but regardless of how it actually happened, the deal was struck. The landlord agreed, and Walter Knott became owner of his very own berry farm. This is particularly notable because Walter planned to use the land for farming berries. Land values in Orange County had inflated over the past seven years. Oil was discovered in the area as far back as the 1880s. By 1924, there were hundreds of wells producing. In total, more than double the money that citrus produced. In Orange County, thousands of acres had been bought looking for oil, and many were successful. There were also a lot of busts, but like during the gold rush 75 years before, land speculation in the area was rampant. In 1923, Knott, Jim Preston, and Jim's brother John worked about a tenth of all the land growing berries in Orange County. The following year, they were the only berry operation left. And in 1927, here was Knott buying the land to keep producing berries when pretty much everyone else, at least as far as berries went, had sold out for oil. At the same time, on an orange grove a few miles north of Knott's farm, a man named Charles Rudolph Boysen planted a few berry plants by a ditch. Rudy, as he was known, created a hybrid of red raspberry, loganberry, and blackberry while living in Napa County around 1923. He'd forgotten about the experimental berry until a neighbor came around, asking what the giant berries were near the edge of his property. Unsure of what the neighbor meant, Boysen checked. Not only had the hybrid worked, but it produced huge, extremely juicy fruit that were also sweeter than the normal blackberry and transported well. When he moved in 1925, he took several of these plants. Some he planted on his in-law's orange grove north of Buena Park but he kept one for himself. Boysen took this one berry plant to the owner of a rare plant nursery in Pasadena named Douglas Coolidge. Impressed with the plant, Coolidge tried to market them, presumably through a pamphlet like this one, as the sensation berry of the 20th century. But Coolidge's nursery didn't specialize in fruiting plants for farming. They already had over 5,000 varieties of plants in their inventory, and they didn't even include the new berry in their yearly catalogs. Because of all this, they didn't really sell any of Boysen's berries. And then Coolidge died. Not long after, Boysen broke his back, making gardening almost impossible for him. Then his in-laws sold the orange grove where he'd planted his extra berry plants. With that, Boysen's experiments in berry hybrids ended and so did the efforts to sell his berry. In the winter between the 1927 and 28 berry seasons, Walter Knott replaced his little berry stand with a permanent stucco building along 80 feet of Grand Avenue. Behind this, and attached to it, he built his family a new home. At the south end of the building was the nursery shop selling plants. In the middle was the berry market, selling fresh berries and berry products, things like jams and the like. At the north end was the tea room, or as Walter put it to Sam Coffrin when he bought the land, a pie and coffee room. This tea room connected directly to the kitchen of the family house. Cordelia and the Knott's daughters would bake pies and rolls, make jams, ice cream, and berry punch, and sell these to the customers. The kids were all expected to help work on the business, but they were also paid for their labor, just like anyone else working for the Knott Farm. The new building opened in spring for the 1928 season. The sign above the door read Knott's Berry Place. It was a success its very first season. 
Walter invested the profits from the new berry market and tea room in expanding the farm, buying and renting more land, including a second plot 25 miles east-northeast near a town called Norco, turning it into a nursery. But right as the knots were starting to get on their feet after all their struggles in the first few years, the Roaring Twenties came to a crashing halt. In September of 1929, the Great Crash began in the New York stock market. Over the next 72 days, the market would continue to fall despite attempts to stabilize it. From November 1929 to April 1930, the market recovered somewhat, though it was still about 30% lower than the highest point before the crash back in September. But on April 18th, it started a decline that would last for the next two and a half years, and bottom out with some measures having lost almost 90% of their September 1929 values. This had a catastrophic impact on farmers like the Knots. Many farms, as we saw several times in the last episode, were bought with loans, mortgaged to large banks, many of whom invested their customers' deposits in the stock market. When these banks saw their reserves drying up due to their stock market losses and as panicked depositors tried to withdraw their funds, the banks called in these loans, many of which farmers couldn't pay. The resulting foreclosures crashed land prices. Now, the original 10 acres Walter bought and was still paying off were worth $300 per acre when he was paying five times that. Still, he honored the deal as it was made. He was forced to sell off the extra land in Norco, but the Knots continued to expand their farm and also could afford to pay an advertising agency and to take out radio, magazine, and newspaper ads. They weren't flourishing, but partly because Knott's deal was with Coffrin and not the banks. They stayed afloat when so many of their neighboring farms sank. Besides, economic crashes were still better than living in the desert, and the Knots were industrious. Walter was always on the lookout for new, better types of berries. He'd started out that first year with advanced blackberries, which got their name because they fruited earlier in the year than other varieties. Then, he'd been an early adopter of young berries, a raspberry, blackberry, and dewberry hybrid. And of course, he was the owner slash proprietor of Knott's Berry Place. He was the berry person in Southern California. So, when a man named George Darrow wanted to track down a man named Boysen, that supposedly lived in Southern California and developed a new berry strain, he went to Walter Knott. Darrow worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and Douglas Coolidge contacted him five years ago, around the time that Walter bought his land. Darrow thought the extra-large berry Coolidge described would be a great way to increase farm yields and feed starving people during the Depression. While on a trip to Southern California, Darrow stopped at Coolidge's rare plants and gardens. Sadly for Darrow, with Coolidge gone and the berries no longer in stock, the employees couldn't really help him. All they could find was a reference to a Mr. Boysen. Walter Knott didn't know anything about Boysen, Coolidge, or the berries either, but Darrow's story interested him. So he agreed to help the man in his search. Knott's first suggestion was the county phone book. There was one listing with the name Boysen the city park supervisor over in Anaheim. They got in contact and learned that this man, Rudy Boysen, had indeed created a berry, which he took to a nursery the city used to buy plants for its parks, Coolidge's rare plants. But Boysen didn't have any of the plants left. He knew there might still be some growing by that irrigation ditch on his in-law's old orange grove, but the problem there was he couldn't give them permission to look they'd need to check with the new landowners. The three men reached out and, with permission secured, they went in search of Boysen's Berry. And down in that irrigation ditch, right where he'd left them, were a few scraggly plants, nearly choked to death by weeds. Because they were out of season, the branches bore no fruit. But Boysen swore they made berries the size of his thumb. With the landowner's permission, 
Not took the vines, propagated a few cuttings, and planted them at his farm. He nurtured them for the following year, and when the vines fruited in the spring of 1933, it turned out Boysen was telling the truth. The berries were enormous, almost twice the size of a loganberry or youngberry, and despite their size, they produced at a similar rate to normal berries. Walter propagated those first few vines into 100 total plants for the 1934 season, and they produced over 2,200 pounds that first year. That's 22 pounds of berry per plant. When he went to sell the berries, not needed a name for them. Some suggested he should name them after himself, but he chose to honor their creator and call them the Boysenberry, forever linking that name to the Knott's farm. Walter charged twice as much per basket over the young berry, and these new berries were so large it took half as many to fill a basket. Overall, they were nearly four times as profitable as his previous cash crop, and by the following year, Walter would have enough plants to begin selling them to other farmers. By 1940, boysenberries were the most popular variety of bushberry in the entire country, and they were the main crop of Knott's Farm. In June of 1934, Cordelia made a decision that would change the entire Knott family forever. She had been adamant that she did not want to open a restaurant and insisted that the tea room be nothing more than that, snacks and light beverages. But with the economy barely beginning to pull itself from its lowest point in the Great Depression, the Knots were still struggling to make ends meet. And while Walter's new boysenberry was looking promising, it hadn't taken off yet. The tea room was only open during the berry season, and it was hard to convince people to drive all the way out to the Knott's farm just for milk and some buttered rolls. So Cordelia decided to try and draw more guests by offering a fried chicken dinner. In addition to the fried chicken, the meal came with a salad, rhubarb sauce, hot biscuits, vegetables, mashed potatoes and gravy, and a slice of berry pie with ice cream on top for dessert. The price? was 65 cents, drinks included. They served the first meals on June 13th, selling a total of eight dinners and serving them all on the Knott's wedding china. Within a couple weeks, people were starting to line up, waiting for available seats, especially on the weekends. And so, in the summer of 1934, the Knott's Berry Place sold its first boysenberries and chicken dinners. The Knots had taken their first steps from being farmers to theme park owners. Hey friends, thanks for watching all the way to the end of this video. Here's a couple more you might like, and if you would, please hit the subscribe button and the thumbs up. It literally costs you nothing except a few seconds, and it truly helps us make more videos like this one. An extra special thanks go out to the people helping us over on Patreon. It's because of their support that you're seeing this video right now. If you want to help the channel out even more, head over to our Patreon and check it out. You can find it through a link in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we hope you have a great day.